Good morning, Smoky Mountain. God is good all the time. Amen. God bless you all for being here this morning, for visiting with us today. We're sure glad you're here as well. In the chairs in front of me, there should be like a little blue card. If you could just take a moment and fill that out, drop that in the offering plate, we sure would appreciate that. If you're a regular attendee, need update or information, or just have a change of address or a prayer request, put that on there as well. We'll make note of, of those things as, as, as well. As we get started, this morning, a few, few announcements. Um, I want to announce uh, next Sunday we are going to honor uh, Smoky Mountains graduates. So if you have a child or a grandchild that is graduating, let me know this week so that we can um, uh, make sure we acknowledge them next week as we kind of honor a couple of our graduates next Sunday. And uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, also, starting uh, Wednesday, June 1st, we'll be doing our Wednesday night cookouts all through the month of June. Um, we, we still need a few volunteers to help with the cooking process of that, so there's a sign-up sheet in the back with that. We sure would appreciate it. Otherwise, bring your favorite dessert, your favorite side dish to care, share, and we'll just kind of uh, fellowship together. If you remember, a couple times last year, we had a lot of people from the community come in on that, so it's a great opportunity for us to not only just get together as a, as a church body, but also possibly serve the community a little bit as, as well. And then Sunday, June 5th, is Pentecost Sunday. Um, most of you know what Pentecost Sunday is. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It's when the church began in the New Testament. And uh, here at Smoky Mountain, we're going to commemorate that on Sunday, June 5th. It's usually 50 days after Easter. And so uh, Pentecost Sunday is June 5th. And what we want to do is, when we take up our offerings, the very first 10%, of everything that's given that day, let's say we have a $4,000 offering that day, the very first 400, the very first 10% is going to go to missions. Um, we're going we're to designate it to Smoky Mountain Christian Camp, which lost their, one of their dormitories last year to a fire, and they're trying to rebuild that. So we're going to designate it to the camp. Uh, so the very first 10%, over and above our normal missions giving, will be going straight to Smoky Mountain Christian Camp that day. And so then we'll take our additional missions off of it, and then what's left goes to our general fund. So I would encourage you, as part of Pentecost Sunday, as part of the celebration of the church, be generous in your giving. Because uh, the more we can send off to the camp, that will be a blessing to them as, as, as well. And, and while we're on the mission of, of camp, um, if you have a child or grandchild that wants to go to camp, uh, maybe you can't afford to go, let me know or whatever. We will gladly make sure that they're able to go to camp. We will make sure that, that their sponsor can go to that. Uh, so we are in that, that season. So, so keep that in mind. If you've got a, a child or grandchild that might be interested in going to camp. But those are just a couple things to keep in mind as we look towards, uh, uh, towards the month of June. And last but not least, um, uh, for the month of May, we're collecting mac and cheese, peanut butter, and Little Debbie snack cakes for uh, Sevier County Food food ministries, and I appreciate your, your donations and generosity to that as well. So, with that being said, let's all stand. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our, our time of worship here today. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord. We thank you for another day of life, the opportunity we have to come together here as family and friends to worship and praise your awesome and holy name, Lord. And God, as we come into this service, God, I pray that we will come to you with right attitudes, right heart, right minds, and that our worship and how we, how, we, how we worship here today, how we meditate, how we hear the word, how we sing, Lord, I just pray our attitudes will honor you, will bless you, will, will worship you worshipfully, God. And Lord, I pray that as your spirit will come move in and through this service, God, I pray that you'll, you'll teach us, you'll, you'll move in and through this place, Lord, and convict us of those things that we need to do different, do better, Lord, and maybe just sense your spirit and your presence in this service here today, God, as we go through this service. Lord, we pray that you'll be with those who cannot be here with us today, Lord. I know there's some that are, that are dealing with illnesses and recovering from, from surgeries and so forth. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that your healing hand be upon them. Lord, those who are, who are traveling, I pray that you'll give them safety in their journeys and bring them back to us again safely, Lord. And God, we pray to those who've traveled here for a little time of R&R &R in the Smokies. Lord, I pray that their time has been a blessing. It's been restful. I pray that you'll give them safety in their journeys back home to their church, their community with a renewed sense of energy and desire to serve you and their part of, of, of the kingdom, Lord. We we love you, we praise you, you're an awesome, holy God, and we give you all the praise and glory. It's in your precious son's name we pray, and all of God's people said. Our call to worship this morning is Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's worship our faithful God.
Father, we thank you for making it well with our souls by sending your son for us. We thank you for your word, which reveals your truth. May we take it into our hearts and honor you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin this morning by saying for visiting with us today, either in person or online or simply been away for a couple weeks. And we've been in this series that we've been calling for such a time as this, which comes from a famous statement that was made by a guy named Mordecai to his younger Jewish cousin named Esther. And like we've been doing throughout this series, let's turn our attention to the screens behind me and let's read out loud in unison these, these famous verses that this series is coming from. Read with me. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so a teacher walks into the classroom and she begins to take attendance. John, she calls out. Here, John replies. Lisa, here. Bobby, here. But what do you do when you call out God's name and no one answers? What do you do when God seems absent? What do you do when you look up to see if he's in his seat, but he, he's gone? Is it, isn't it true that life is filled with periods of silence when we wonder where God is? We can't hear his voice. We don't sense his presence. So we look toward the places that we've normally seen him, but he is seemingly not there. It's like you're swimming in a huge lake and you're getting a little ways offshore and, and a big fog, fog kind of rolls in and just kind of envelops you and you're trapped in a tiny little circle of diffused light and you can hardly see your hands in front of your face and you begin to swim towards the shore, at least you hope it's the shore, but you're not sure because you're completely lost your sense of direction. And so you begin to panic and your heart begins to pound and you decide that, you know what, I'm just going to turn around and float on my back for a little bit to kind of conserve what little energy I have remaining and hoping that maybe in the silence you, you might hear a voice from the shore but as you swim, so you can swim towards it, but there's nothing to be heard. It was that sense of panic and lostness that must have swept over Mordecai and Esther as they pondered the edict that had been signed into law by the Persian king Xerxes though through the evil, evil wicked servant Haman that on a certain day and a certain month of a certain year, all the Jews in the Persian empire were going to be annihilated. Now for Mordecai, Esther, and all their fellow Jews, it must have felt like, it must have felt like they couldn't see through the fog. It must, have, it must have seemed like God was absent. However, for those of us who have read through this story, and hope you've been taking my encouragement to read through the story at least once a week since we started this series, we know better. And we, we see that even though God's name is not mentioned anywhere in the book, it's clear to us that at least not to them, that God seems absent. Even though his name is not mentioned, he's present. His fingerprints are all over this story. And when the fog rolls in and when we can't see the shore, he's still there. Nowhere is the invisible hand of God more evident than in the upcoming chapters 5, 6, and 7, where we're going to be today and in the weeks ahead. And so if you have your Bibles with you today, use a Bible app on your phone or device. Open them with me to Esther chapter 5. Now, if you've not been with us or maybe you've, you've kind of uh, missed a couple weeks, um, you know, as you know, if you've been here, a lot has happened. And, and, and so we don't really have time to go back and recap everything that's happened in the story thus far. But I would say that if you're new to this series, new to this story, maybe new to this church, um, I would encourage you maybe to go back and listen to the other sermons. But more importantly, maybe go back and read the, the book of Esther. You know, it's, it, you can do it if, you got a, if you're an average reader, you can do it in about 15 or, or 20 minutes. But in Esther chapter 5, we find ourselves today, Esther's about to enter the king's throne room unannounced to take her stand for God and for his people. Her cousin Mordecai, who had taken care of her like his own daughter since her parents had, had died, had convinced her that perhaps, perhaps this was God's reason for giving her life, for putting her on the earth. 
for making her such a beautiful woman so she would catch the king's eye when he was selecting his new queen and for making her the queen of Persia. And so after three days of fasting and presumably a lot of praying for God's wisdom and help, Esther decides that she's going to go to the king even though it's against the law. And that is when the second most famous line in the book comes out, where she basically says, and if I perish, I perish. Now, as we said last week, this was Esther's faith-defining moment. But she's understandably a little bit nervous here. And so we can't begin, so we can kind of imagine that her heart was racing, her, her knees are knocking, her, her hands are a little bit sweaty as she approached the entrance to the king's throne room, which brings us to Esther chapter 5, verse 1. Read it with me. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. In other words, she made herself presentable. She didn't come in with her hair rollers and sweatpants. She came in her royal robes, stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall, the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. Now, in between Esther 4 and 5, there's kind of this dramatic pause where we're kind of left in suspense. We're not told anything that happened during that three-day fast, but here's the thing. This pause represents a silent yet powerful interlude during which Esther drew from the source of her strength. And even though God is seemingly silent, I believe that in those three days he was working on her heart and on the hearts of others, including the king, who not so coincidentally responds favorably to Esther. This reminds me of something that prophet Isaiah wrote about. He said, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Friends, when we find ourselves in one of those periods of our lives when God seems to be silent, we need to wait upon the Lord for wisdom, strength, and courage. But not only that, like Esther, we need to, to ask others to pray and fast with us. And, and, then, there, and then, then we should just kind of give it over to God and, and wait with a listening ear and a watchful eye, which is exactly what Esther does. She waited. She fasted. She prayed. And she listened. And as a result, she was able to step into the presence of the king calmly, courageously, and wisely. Which begs the question, what's going to happen to her? I mean, keep in mind, this was a very risky thing for her to do. Because anyone who came to the inner court without being, without being summoned would be killed unless the king held out his golden scepter. And Esther had not been summoned for 30 days, even though she was the king's wife. As I were taking notes, here's something you might write down. When God seems silent, he gives courage, grace, and guidance. Courage, grace, and guidance. Look at verse 2 of our text. When he, King Xerxes, saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her. I imagine that, that he got, he just, you know, he just does those same feelings he had when he originally saw her a few years earlier, just came over him again as he's just, he's just caught again by her beauty and, and he holds out the golden scepter, or scepter to her that was in his hand. And so Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Now, the text doesn't tell us exactly why Esther found favor with the king in that moment, aside from her obviously natural beauty and character, but here's what we do know. We know that she had fasted and prayed for God's favor, which was more powerful and more important than all the beauty, money, and power that the world could offer. You know, I, I find no comfort in the butterfly effect. It offers me no solace to ponder its possibility. You're thinking, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? What is the butterfly effect? Well, the butterfly effect traces the existence of a hurricane in Florida to a busy insect in West Africa. And it goes something like this. A butterfly flaps its wings at just the right time and stirs the smallest gust of air. But that burst of air grows and grows and grows, rippling around the globe until it finally results in a chaotic storm. 
Now, I'm on board with the butterfly effect in the sense that small things can lead to big things. I mean, but it's not the result I question. Rather, it's the randomness of it all that I don't agree with. I mean, are humans merely the victims of butterflies flapping its wings? Do entire cities wash out to sea because an insect is active? Are we nothing more than weather vanes whipped about by a faceless fate? Who finds consolation in the philosophies of happenstance, big bang theories, and mere accidents of nature? I don't. But I do find great comfort in the promises of God who said, Our God is in the heavens. He does as He wishes, Psalm 115, verse 3. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can oppose what I do, Isaiah 43, 13. We were chosen from the beginning to be gods, and all things happened, just as He decided long ago, Ephesians 1, 11. One prophet asked, who can command things to happen without the Lord's permission? Lamentations 3.37. Another prophet declared, No one can interrupt his work. No one can call his rule into question. Daniel 4.35. God himself declared, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I do all that I please. Isaiah 46.10. So the butterfly might stir. The butterfly might flap its wings, but only with the permission of God can a wing flap create a hurricane. He is the blessed controller of all things, 1 Timothy 6, 16. And this last one will be on the screen behind me. The Apostle John wrote, This is a confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, and by the way, according to his will is kind of a key passage there. And we know that he hears us. And we know that we have what we asked for. Listen, Esther, Mordecai, and all the Jewish people in Susa went into this together in prayer. And I don't miss that. The well-known author and preacher Max Lucado, in his most recent book about Esther entitled they were, for, You Were Made for This Moment, talks about how many years ago his family was living, they were serving in Brazil as missionaries, and a new Christian came to the church, and, and he came to the church leaders with a very specific question. This new young believer in Brazil had been kind of reading his Bible, and, and he discovered a promise from Matthew chapter 21, where Jesus said, whatever you, you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. And the man wanted to know, does our church believe this passage? And now what would you expect a, a missionary to say, well, yeah, of course, we, we believe in, in prayer. And that's when that new young Brazilian believer asked, then why do we work so hard and pray so little? It's a great question. Why do we work so hard and pray so little? Why did King Xerxes extend the golden scepter to Esther? May I suggest that it had a lot to do with the prayers of Esther, Mordecai, and all these desperate Jews who were living under a death sentence where if God had not intervened, they would have perished. But not only that, the king must have known that Esther was desperate to take such a big risk without being desperate. So he extends to her the golden scepter, and when he did so, you can just imagine, Esther must have breathed a big sigh of relief. Breathe with me. Right? She must have breathed a big sigh of relief. Now, if you're taking notes, here's an interesting observation. Esther should have received death, but she was given grace. Look at verse 3 of our text. The king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom will be given to you. Now, if I had been Esther, good thing I'm not. If I would have been Esther, I would have jumped all over this and I would have taken that opportunity to bring the house down on evil Haman, right? But Esther teaches, she's teaching us that when you've waited on God, then you're not in a hurry. You're not just rushing ahead of God and you have a sense of godly wisdom and timing. 
Esther had prayerfully thought this through. She has a plan. And because she knows that the king likes to party. Everybody say that with me. Party. Oh, come on. The king likes to party. She invites him, an evil Haman, to a party in verse 4 of our text. And then in verse 5, the king says, bring Haman at once so that we may do as Esther requests. So we can go to her party. And so the king and Haman went to the party that Esther prepared. And, and as they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther a second time, now what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom will be granted. Esther may have paused here, I suspect. And she replies, my petition, my request is this. If the king regards me with favor. And if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, again, she says, if it pleases the king, she's playing to his, his ego. She knows how this guy works. Let the king and Haman come tomorrow to another party that I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Now, on the one hand, this might seem like Esther's putting off the inevitable, because, but on the other hand, we know that this is all a part of God's timing. Because keep in mind the bigger picture that's going on here. It seems like the fog is everywhere for Esther and the Jews, but that fog is beginning to lift. Light is beginning to shine. Listen real quickly, church. When God seems absent, he's present. And we see him giving Esther courage because Esther was afraid. She previously told her cousin Mordecai that she, there's no way she could approach the king. It could mean that he could, it could mean my, the end of my life. And Esther, she experienced fear just like we experience fear. But God gave her courage. God gave her resolve to do the right thing, which begs the question, do you think, do you think that anything, that this had anything to do with those three days of fasting and praying and waiting on the Lord? Of course it did. So why did Esther put off her request? Not once, but twice. Was she afraid? Was she buying time? Was she trying to butter the king up, trying to loosen him up a little bit, you know, with these parties and so forth? I mean, the king kind of got into that sort of thing. We don't know exactly, but what we do know is that her waiting another day to make a request is absolutely crucial to the story. You might want to read ahead to chapter 6, because we're going to see next week that very same night... Something really big would happen that would set the stage for her to make her big request. So I have a hunch that Esther just, she just sensed in her spirit that the timing wasn't right. That she needed to wait one more day. And I think that was one of those gentle nudges by the Holy Spirit that she listened to. The Holy Spirit was working in the Old Testament as well. You know that, don't you? Now, I, I will admit that I get, a little, I get a little nervous around people who are always saying, well, God told me to do this or God told me to do that. But I do know, I do believe that God guides his people even in the fog. Sometimes, oftentimes, through his word. Sometimes, oftentimes, in prayer. Sometimes through the counsel of a godly friend. Sometimes through weighing the options and doing what seems right. And yes, sometimes through that small, still voice, those small, still nudges. Now, that being said, let's, for a brief moment, fast forward here several hundred years, all the way to our day and time, and see how that same grace that Esther received has been extended to us. I think I've included this in your notes, but it's not that we could have received death. Rather, it's that we should have received death because of our sins against a holy and righteous God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This verse right here, this one you're looking at, that right there is what Brian Powell deserves. And what everyone in this room, watching online, the entire world deserves death. I'm not simply talking about you just stop breathing, you know, you just, you just die kind of thing. You know, I'm not just talking about that, but I'm talking about separation from God in a very eternal, real place called hell. That's what I deserve. 
It's what we all deserve because of our sins against God. For the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, mercy is defined as getting what we do of not getting what we do deserve. And grace is defined as getting what we don't deserve. So what we deserve, church, is death. What we don't deserve is to be in a life-giving relationship with a holy and righteous God. Yet we are told that through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, he paid for the sins of all those who will call upon, confess him as Savior and Lord. I don't know if you realize how beautiful of a thing this is, church. If you think about how in the story Xerxes extended the golden scepter and Esther was able to come before the king, Esther should have received death because it was against the law to go before the king like that, but she got grace from King Xerxes. And if we parallel, parallel that to the gospel story, we see God as the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of everything, and instead of sending some heavenly warrior angels down to kill us and send us to hell, he extends to us not a golden scepter, but a cross and an empty tomb. Can I get an oh yeah? It's a beautiful picture of grace. You and I deserve death, yet we receive grace through Jesus. Amen? Kind of reminds me of a song by a contemporary Christian musician named Jeremy Camp. Maybe you've heard of him. A Dead Man Walking is the name of the song, and here's a few lines from it. I was a dead man walking until I was a man walking with you. I was a blind man falling until I felt the life you're calling me to. Pulling me out of the darkness and pulling me out of the lies, putting the beat in my heart again. I was a dead man walking until you love the dead man walking back to life. You ever felt like that before? Have you ever felt like a, a dead person walking before knowing Jesus, that, that you were heading to hell, which is what you deserve, and then he brought us back to life through what Jesus did on the cross and through an empty grave? I'm reminded of someone else who should have died, but clearly through providential grace, he lived. His story took place in the 1700s. I don't know how many of us were alive back then, but during 1755, the French Indian War was going on. Some of you might remember it. An Indian chief who had all of his sharpshooting arrows, it took place somewhere around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he had all these sharpshooting arrows shooting at the British. There was about 1,459 British troops. Within two hours, almost 1,000 of them were killed or injured. But there was this one lieutenant colonel that kept going kept pressing on. Uh, and of course, back in those days, officers would ride horses, which made them much bi bigger, easier targets. And, and those sharpshooting Indians, just, they just kept shooting at him. And the chief instructed his warriors, go after that one. Keep shooting at him until he's dead. And as they kept shooting, he just kept riding. In fact, he had at least two horses shot from out underneath him. But somehow he stayed alive. And, and finally, at the end of the day, the chief just said, stop shooting at him. He is covered. By divine providence. Those were the words of the Indian chief. Well, that lieutenant colonel eventually made it back to his tent. According to most records, you know, most reports, it was believed that he was dead. He wasn't. And so he sat down to pen a letter stating that he wasn't dead. And, but what they did say, what he did say is that as he was taking off his coat in his tent, he, he noticed that there was a bullet hole underneath his arm. And so he looked and and just kind of stuck his chest and see if there was any kind of markings or anything like that. And, and then he completely took off his coat. To his surprise, it wasn't just one bullet hole, but four bullet holes. Not a single scratch anywhere on his body. A, a bullet should have at least grazed him somewhere. None. The lieutenant colonel attributed that to God's divine providence, as did the Indian chief. In fact, 15 years later, in 1770, this lieutenant colonel had moved up in rank. And he came back to that area where the battle had been fought there around Pittsburgh. And, and he, him and the chief got together and they talked and they sat down. And the chief said how amazing it was that the protection of the divine was on you. That lieutenant colonel in 1755, now a general in 1770, was none other than... George Washington. And the chief proclaimed, we could tell the great spirit was upon you. But not only that, if you know your history, 
1770, a few years before the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, in 1770, the, that Indian prophesied, and I quote, the great spirit protects that man pointing to Washington and guides his destinies. He'll become the chief of nations, and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I have come to pay homage to the man who is a particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. End of quote. Incredible story about George Washington, who is someone who should have died in battle, but without a doubt was extended providential grace, a golden scepter of grace, so to speak, as he became the founding father and the first president of this great nation. In a like manner, let's go back, Esther could have, should have received death, but got grace. You and I should get death. We've been given grace through Jesus Christ. And so if you're taking notes, Esther should have got death, got grace, and then, write this down, Mordecai should have received grace, but was given a death sentence. You see, if you remember back to Esther chapter 2, I know it's been a few weeks, I know we've slept a little bit, but if you remember back in chapter 2, Mordecai had uncovered a plot to have the king assassinated, which was noted, and this is important to know, that that attentive plot on the king was written down in the annual books of the kingdom and those books were of course put in the library of the kingdom that's going to come into play next week so if you're reading ahead you'll want to make note of this and so the but here's the thing Mordecai was never given any kind of an award or a promotion for saving the king's life back in chapter two in fact in chapter three if you remember it was evil Haman who was promoted to the king's second in command and of course Haman used his position and authority to get the king to issue the irreversible edict that on a certain day and a certain month of a certain year all the Jews in the Persian Empire would be annihilated and so you see Mordecai should have received grace for saving the king's life but was given a death sentence because of his Jewish connection Meanwhile, back in the palace, evil Haman was living life to the fullest, right? I mean, he, he, was, he was the king's second in command. He had been invited by the Esther to not one, but to two banquets with the king and queen, which brings us to verses 9 through 12 of our text. We're not going to read them word for word, but basically I'll summarize it for you. Um, Haman's on top of the world. Everything seemed to be going his way, and, and so he bragged about his wealth. He bragged about his kids. He bragged about his authority in, in the king's palace. He, he bragged about getting a second invitation to the king's banquet and with the king and queen, and, and he was the only one invited. He bragged about that, but there was just one thing. Mordecai, that Jew, refused to bow down to him, which made Haman madder than a hornet. And in verses 13 and 14, look with me, verses 13 and 14, all this, all this power and wealth and notoriety, he said, gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. But his wife, Zersh, the ever-supporting wife here, <laughs> and all of his friends said to him, why don't you have a pole set up, reaching the height of 50 cubits, that's about 75 feet high, and asked the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. What, a, what kind of wife is that giving that kind of advice? She says, let's get rid of him now. Let's make a spectacle of Mordecai. Let's show the world you bow down to Haman. Then, my dear husband, you can, you can go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pool set up. Now again, Haman's on top of the world, and he didn't have to let Mordecai ruin his day by simply not bowing down, yet he let, Morde let Mordecai ruin his day. In fact, he in essence said, even though I've already got the king to issue this edict that Mordecai and all his Jews are going to be eliminated and killed in a few months from now, instead of letting it go, knowing his perceived problem had already been taken care of, he still could only focus on Mordecai's slight of him, which brings us to the end of Esther chapter 5. Now, with that being said, I think there are at least four 
faith proclamations we can glean from Esther chapter 5 here this morning. Number one, write this down. There's favor given to those who walk by faith. Now, let me be very clear about this, church. This does not mean we'll always be spared hardships, okay? This does not mean that things in our lives will always go well for us, but we've seen over and over again how Esther received favor from the king, received favor from other people as well, and, and you and I, church, through Jesus, receive favor in God's eyes. We're able to be in a relationship with him. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. So if you want to have the favor of God, then we live by faith. We trust in and follow his word and we allow his Holy Spirit to lead us and we find favor to God through Christ. And number two, write this down, there's an enemy who despises you. And you know that, don't you? There's an enemy who despises you. Mordecai had Haman who despised him. I mean, Haman hated Mordecai. And friends, we have someone who hates us even more than that. The enemy of, is our enemy, is, is the enemy of God. Of course, it's obvious it's Satan. He's our enemy and he despises us so much so that he wants to kill us. Jesus said it like this in John 10, 10, the thief, referring to Satan, only comes to kill, kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus, that's what the thief does. He's all about destroying you, destroying me. But we, but Jesus said, I come that you, that we may have life and have it to the full. I was thinking about this this past week. There's a lot of people, and I, probably some of you in this room, who think death is the enemy. You're scared to death of death. You, you, you think death is, is, is the worst possible thing that could happen. I think in some ways death is one of the best things that could happen. Because here's the thing. Death is not the enemy. Hear me on this. Death is not the enemy. Death without Christ is the enemy. All right? Death without Christ is the enemy. Listen, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ today, then you should be scared of death. And you should really fear what is to come after death, eternal life in hell. But if you have Jesus, then we do not need to be afraid. Which brings us to this third faith proclamation. We do not need to fear the enemy. Why? Because God has already won. Satan was defeated at the cross through the empty grave. And, and we can live in that victory. We need to not be afraid of the enemy anymore. Because he, even though he is powerful, our God is more powerful. 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul said this. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through who? Through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I love... How Mordecai didn't bow in Esther chapter 3. But along comes Haman, who's more powerful. Everybody bowed to Haman. Everybody thought Haman was all that in a bag of chips, right? But not Mordecai. Mordecai was like, <laughs> I'm not going to bow to you, Haman. I'm going to bow to God. And I'll honor my king. But not you, Haman. I love how he stood up. And we talked about that a few years ago, a few weeks ago. He didn't fear the enemy. I'm reminded of a story out of communist China about these two young girls who were Christians and their pastor who were there in prison together for their faith in Christ. And the pastor, <laughs> wow, he made a deal with those communist guards. The guards said, Pastor, if you will shoot those girls... We'll let you live. Another prisoner who was in the, in the same prison, you know, as these two girls, you know, told this story after it happened. He said that the pastor approached these girls who, who were scared, obviously, but, but they were resolute. They, they were determined not to deny Christ. And the pastor came up to them and he said, rather arrogantly, why should all three of us die? If I kill you, 
they have said that they will let me live. And that I can continue the work of the church. Can you imagine me saying that to you all? Can you imagine a pastor saying that to his, to his, 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 his congregants? Well, the girls, man, they were so gracious. They looked at their pastor. And according to the prisoner who told this story, they said, Pastor, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for showing us the love of Christ and teaching us the gospel. We want to thank you for baptizing us and teaching us how to have communion. And we want to thank you for your teachings that you've given to us through the years. But, Pastor, we also know that you taught us that sometimes Christians will make bad choices. And they have to come back to God and repent. So as you go through this choice... And you're making, you're making this decision. Our prayer for you, pastor, is that you will repent like Peter and not be despised like Judas after you do this. But know this, pastor. We're not going to, at our deaths mad at you. Incredible statement by these girls. We have forgiven you. We love you. We care for you. And that pastor, cold-hearted, hard-hearted, Pulled the trigger and shot both of those girls. The communist guards turned around, and you know what they did? Shot the pastor anyway. Point is, church, like those girls, we need not fear the enemy because the Bible says that the one who is inside of us, one who's inside of those girls, is greater than the one who's in the world. 1 John 4 4. Amen. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who led the Jerusalem church, wrote, Submit yourselves unto God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. James knew what that meant because James was willing to stand up to his enemies, even the enemies of Christianity. This happened in the, in the 60s, 62 A.D., some say it was around 69 A.D., but James, the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, the half-brother of Jesus, was taken by the Jewish leaders to the pinnacle of the temple. And they said to James, if you don't deny Jesus and deny the resurrection, we're going to put you off this pinnacle and we're going to kill you. Well, James starts preaching. He starts preaching to the people down below. And listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the Messiah we've been waiting for. He is the Son of God. He died for your sins and you can be saved to live a life for him. And after giving this short gospel sermon, it said that those below began to, began to cheer and praise God in Jesus' name. While others said, I can't believe he's doing this. And as the commotion was going on below, those Jewish leaders pushed James off the temple to his death. But according to the story, it said that when he landed, he managed to get back up on his knees. The, the fall didn't kill him after all. And James started praying. And so some other people started pelting him with stones. And while another one exclaimed, he's praying for you. How can you do this? And finally, someone picked up a big old stick and hit him in the back of the head. And ultimately, James went to see his half-brother Jesus and spent eternity in heaven. Like James, like those two young girls, we need not be afraid of the enemy. And last but not least, number four, focusing on the wrong things robs us of satisfaction. Haman was focused on this one person instead of everything else that he had going for him. He focused on what he didn't have rather than what he did have. And a lot of times, church, I know you're getting ready to pack up, but stay with me. A lot of times we think, we think, will satisfy us actually leaves us empty. This begs the question. Where does your satisfaction rest? I love what author and pastor John Piper has said, and I quote, God is more glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So here's my question for you today. I hear you zipping up. Stay with me. How glorified is God in you based on your satisfaction in him? Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus was in essence saying, I am satisfaction guaranteed. I will fulfill everything that you need. 
The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You know this. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This morning, have you found your joy? your contentment, your satisfaction, your strength in Christ and in Christ alone? Or are you looking for it in all the wrong people, places, and things? God is more glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Amen? Let's stand. We pray with me, Father God, we come before this morning, Lord, thanking you for Esther's courage, this beautiful, beautiful, incredible story we've been looking at these last several weeks, God, and I pray that we will have the faith and the courage and the boldness of Esther and Mordecai in our lives, God, and of those two, con- those two girls, Lord, of, of James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, God, I pray that we'll be bold in our stands and, and, and we'll find our satisfaction and joy in you and you alone, because you gave it all so that we could have it all. So God, forgive us when we go looking other ways or we chicken out. God, as we go through this time of decision, this time of, of, of contemplating where we are with you, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll, you'll speak to our hearts and our souls. You can fix the things we need to do differently. God, there'll be one here this morning does not know you as their Savior and Lord. I pray they'll take that stand today because who knows what could happen when they walk out this door, Lord. It could be their last chance. Others of us, God, we just need to, we've got some things we need to do different, do better in our lives, God. Others of us just got some burdens we need to have lifted, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, that we will respond to those gentle nudgings that the Spirit puts on us these next few minutes. We love you. We praise you. It's in your Son's name we pray. And all of God's people said. Amen. Above all, won't you come as we sing this song? chance to meet Mike and J- Jackie ha- Householder. They've been attending church now for several weeks, and they've come forward this morning to commit to membership here at Smoky Mountain Christian Church. We're excited to have them, and I know Mike's going to work with us. They're both going to work with us on some, some ministry stuff as well in the, in the weeks ahead, but we're just glad to have them. So I'm going to 
How do you put to repeat that great confession of faith I know you've made many times, made, made many years ago? Repeat after me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of Living God, the Son of living God. and we have accepted Him, and we accepted him as, our Savior and Lord. as our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Amen. Mark. We also uh, want to invite uh, John Leach and his wife up here this morning. John came to us this past week. Last week, and he wants to. He just wants us to pray over them. You know, James tells us in James chapter five that you know sometimes if you have some things going on in your life, to to uh, call the elders and ask them to pray over you. So uh, John and, and his wife um, are going to come here this morning. We're going to lay hands on them, and the elders are going to pray over over both of them this morning. This is John's request. This is per- biblical request, his part. So. The Apostle Paul spoke these words to the Corinthian brethren, and I believe as well as us today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, Paul said there, So if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. As elders, these men who sit before you, we are often called upon to perform duties and responsibilities that are in God's word, placed upon us as the eldership of Smoky Mountain Christian Church. One of these may be the calling to anoint with oil and prayers at time when strength and healing is needed in the mind, body, and spirit. In this special time, we are asking that Christ, our Lord and our Savior, for the strength to give us faith, to strengthen our faith, to those who request, and that God's grace will be bestowed upon them in a time of anxiety pain, and suffering. Today, John Leach has requested that we do this for his wife, Sherry, his beloved wife, his soulmate for so many years. Sherry has been sick for about 13 years now. And as our preacher referred to James, I want to refer to this scripture in James. If anyone among you be sick, let them call for the elders of the church, and they should pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. We have prepared this time and this place to do just that. And we count it an honor and a privilege to carry out God's word, his commands. And we count it a privilege to do this for John and Sherry. As we anoint Sherry with oil and pray for her, I want the church to be in prayer for that. And may God bless us in special ways, but most of all, bless Sherry and her beloved husband, John. I will ask the elders to come at this time.
Father, God, we come before this morning, Lord, on behalf of Sherry, Lord, and you know she's been struggling for a long time, God, and I just pray in Jesus' name, as the Bible says, Lord, that your, your hand of comfort and peace and joy will be upon her, Lord. I pray she'll sense our love for her and, and for her husband, John, here today, Lord, and just help them in this very difficult season that they'll be going through, Lord. God, we all love Sherry, and she, her smile and, and energy just uh, brings a smile to me every week I see her, Lord, and I get, love, love her hugs and, and her, her, her kindness, Lord, and I just pray that you'll be with her. And be with John as well as he takes care of his, his lovely bride. We love you. We praise you. In your precious son's name we pray. Lord, before us are two dear friends. John and Sherry have been friends of mine for many, many years. And I think what you said to us, that we are your friends if we could keep your commandments. One of the things you've commanded us, Lord, is to pray for one another. And so, Lord, here this morning at this time, we lift up to you our brother John and our sister Sherry. To you, Lord, that your mighty hand of power and peace and comfort would be upon them. Father, you have told us that we could come boldly before your throne. And that we do today. We ask for healing, a clear mind, a strong body, and a strong spirit. We ask that you would lay your healing hand on Sherry. We do this in Heavenly Father, this morning, uh, Lord, there is no greater feeling than to be able to walk with you, and to be able to know that even in times when we may not sense your presence, Lord, that you are still there. Uh, Lord, for these two, your servants, and for John and Sherry, Lord, um, we ask that in the times ahead that there would be comfort, Lord, that there might be a, a bright, shining moment of understanding. Lord, that anything uh, that comes to them from a, a smallest of blessings to the largest in the end, it all comes from you ultimately. Lord, with this uh, anointing, Lord, we ask that, uh, that you would bring them peace. And uh, we ask all of this in your son's name. Almighty God. Lord, as we come here in this time that we anoint with oil as you commanded, and Lord, as we pray for Sherry, Lord, in a special way, bless her, touch her as only you can, and Lord, we pray for John as he has taken such good care of her, we pray for strength for continue to do so, but Lord, right now, we thank you for your power and for your presence. Lord, as we pray through Christ our Lord, that your glory will come from your Father as it is promised, and touch her in a special way. This we pray in Jesus' name, through our Lord.
We were ready, both. And I was told, and brother, I'm sorry if it is your turn or whatever, but we want to, at Smoky Mountain Christian Church, we want to pattern ourselves after the first church, and we do. And we take the communion every Lord's Day. And as these emblems are passed around just in a few minutes, there are two cups. One has the loaf in the bottom, and the other one has the juice on top. And you take, as you meditate upon what took place for us at Calvary. Within the pages of this book, the greatest love story is told there that ever was or ever will be. And I want to share with you just one scripture. John 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. And Jesus did that for you and I. And we thank him so much from the depths of our hearts for going to that old rugged cross and dying for us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So this morning, or this afternoon, as we partake of these emblems, we want to look back through the eye of faith and see our precious Lord and Savior as he hang there between the heavens and earth on that old rugged cross. It wasn't his sins that put him there. It was yours and my sin that put him there. And we thank God for that. So as we prepare our hearts, let us do so in a manner that will be pleasing to God as we take these emblems. Shall we pray? Father, God, through our Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross, we want to give you the utmost thanks for taking our place there. And Lord, as we partake of these emblems, this loaf to us is to remind us of that body that was pierced that crown of thorns was placed upon his brow. The suffering and the pain that he went through there that day was for every one of us. And Lord, I pray as we partake of this fruit of the vine to us as Christians, reminds us of that precious blood that was shed there to cover all the sins of the world. And we just ask that, Lord, we would respond in our obedience to him. And, Lord, that we might look to the old rugged cross this morning to see Jesus and him alone dying for us. This we pray in his precious name.
just as was alluded to in the sermon, in what it's not about wealth, or maybe the Sunday school lesson. But we come to a time in our service that we have the opportunity to give back to God just a small part of what he has been so graciously given to us. So let us pray for this offering. Father, again, we come before thee. Lord, we think of all the things that the church is involved in and all the things that needs to take place that the church might prosper, you might be glorified. And Lord, I pray that we will give with a cheerful heart. Bless us all. Bless those who give and those who have it not. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in singing as we're giving our offerings today. 